We are in the midst of our Lenten sermon series, and for those who have not been here every week, I want to make sure each week we catch each other up. Um, We are exploring the question we ask folks when they join the United Methodist Church. And that, among those questions we ask uh, is, and, and I probably should do this, we, we ask people, do they believe in God? Do they accept Christ as their Savior? Do they believe in the words contained in the Old and New Testament as the Word of God sufficient for salvation? And then we ask them, do you promise to support our Lord and this, His church, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? So the first week, uh, we, we, we took those five themes and have I've been using those to guide our discussions on Sunday mornings during these first five weeks of Lent. Uh, so the first week we talked about prayer and we used uh, Jesus' prayer uh, that was such a model prayer as he prayed for himself and for his disciples and for us. Um, and then we talked about presence and talked about being fully present and, and being able to allow ourselves to be fully immersed wherever we are. Last week, we talked about gifts. We talked about money. We talked about the fact that doing ministry costs money and that we call upon the members of the church uh, to, to answer God's call to, to give generously and joyfully uh, with a joyful heart. So this week, we're talking about service. Now, it is clear at Atlanta First, if you've ever set foot in Atlanta First and if you've been here for uh, 50 years or five months, This has been a church committed to serving beyond its walls. It's a hallmark of who we are. And so we talk a lot about that kind of service. And and part of today's sermon could be focused on that and and, and will be. But but what I want to focus on this morning is we ask someone to join the church and support our Lord and this is church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness I wanted to focus on that service, which we call its members and regular worshipers and those who come into contact to the church. Because it takes a lot of people to make sure that the church can do what it's called to do. It requires time. Last week we talked about, we talked about money, but this week it's really talking about time. There's certainly two ways to determine where our priorities are. Where we spend our time and where we spend our money. If we look at our checkbooks and our calendars, then it will become clear what our priorities are. There's no way around that. And so, so we talk about our time. And we also talk about what God has called us to do. Now hang with me for a second on this one. When I think about, the, I, I, I love to laugh. And, and I've often said that as Christians, we should take what we do seriously, but we should not take ourselves too seriously, right? So the iconic 1980 movie, The Blues Brothers. How many people have seen The Blues Brothers? A lot of us have seen The Blues Brothers. So, and this will make sense in a matter. Shannon's always wondering, sometimes Shannon's like, where is he going with this? So there's that, that so what we, we meet Jake and Elwood, Two, played by two of the most genius comics we've had, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, Jake finds himself recently released from prison, picked up by his brother, and they're beginning to try to reestablish themselves, and they go to see their, their friend and kind of father figure, Curtis. And here was Curtis's admonition to them, to them. He said, you need to get yourself in church. So his, their friend, the first thing that he tells them to do is that they need to get themselves in church. So they pull up in the blues mobile, that old beat up, converted police car, and they pull up to the front of a church, and they walk in, and the preacher is bringing it. And who played the preacher? James Brown. That's it. And so James Brown is preaching and he's talking about getting right with God and, and he's just absolutely preaching his heart out. And then he does something that I promise you I will never do. He breaks into song. <laughs> and he starts singing and the choir gets up and the whole congregation gets to their feet and they begin singing. And, 
and, and, and Jake and Elwood are standing in the back of the church. And unlike our church, it's got a full center aisle that comes all the way down the middle. And as James Brown continues to sing, uh, uh, Elwood notices that his brother's just beginning to kind of get into the moment. And, 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 and at some point, the pastor stops preaching. He says, Have, can you see the light? And, and they, they go outside the church and the clouds part and a big ray of light comes in through the big stained glass window and it focuses on John Belushi's character. And he gets more and more filled with the Spirit. And, and now, it's, it's a little irreverent, y'all. If you remember it, if you remember his line, it's a little irreverent. But then he says, I have seen the light. And then he does something that I've wished I could do at every church I've served is he does round off back handsprings all the way down the center aisle of the church. And he stands up in the front and he says, I have seen the light. And then for the rest of the movie, when they go to try to reconnect their band so that they can raise the $5,000 to save the place, the orphanage where they were raised, when they first walk in the door, what's the first thing they say? We are on a mission from God. All right. What does this have to do with Service. The prophet Isaiah, a few years before the Blues Brothers came around, had a call experience of his own. In the sixth chapter of Isaiah, we hear these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the entire temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook and the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs, and the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. You are forgiven Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Now let's break this down for a minute because quite frankly, this scene is something that Hollywood can only hope to reenact. Sometimes we read over these things and we gloss over them and we don't fully appreciate the enormity of what we're reading or what we're hearing. Isaiah has gone into the Holy of Holies, likely the Ark of the Covenant sitting right in front of him and likely that is what he says is the throne of God. And just the hem of God's robe majestically fills the entire space and these strange creatures likely snake looking creatures are flying above let's think about that for a moment several months ago we were scouted for another movie and uh and it was a uh it was it actually it was actually i actually guess it was a television show and it was one of these it was one of the zombie ones. I don't know which one it was. But they wanted to bring fans into our sanctuary, and they wanted those fans to be able to blow up to like 60 or 70 miles an hour. And um, as cool as that sounded, um, I just wasn't sure that was the right thing for us. However, when I read this text this morning, I kind of think about what that might have looked like in here. Think about it. And I, it doesn't say what color his his... His, his, the theme of his robe was, but we use purple and lint to recognize majesty. So maybe we imagine this huge purple robe and, and, and as we walk in, we really can't see because this large purple hem just kind of blows in, in the wind and, and, and fills this entire space. 
And, and I'm just telling you, I don't like any kind of crazy looking creatures, particularly if they look anything like a snake. And, and so if I walk in and can't hardly make my way through the space because of a purple garment, and then I see these, I, I think I'm probably going to run away. But Isaiah stayed and he realized that he was in the presence of God and fear immediately struck him. Because in other places in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the Hebrew tradition, the one who sees God often loses their life. I can imagine Isaiah kinda, kinda going, well, I, I'm still all here. And I'm in the presence of God. To add to the majesty and to add to the, to the awe, the room fills with smoke, likely from these hot coals that are placed at the altar. And Isaiah just kind of confesses I'm not worthy to be in God's presence and I, I come from people who aren't worthy to be in God's presence. You gotta understand, to be able to be this far inside the temple, you would have had to be rendered ritually clean. You, you would have had to be, in the eyes of humans, almost perfect to have gotten this far. But yet Isaiah recognizes that in the presence of God, we are all unworthy. And so... With fear and trepidation, he, he lifts up a prayer of confession and at the same time, a, a prayer of adoration as his eyes have seen God. And then one of these crazy creatures comes and, and takes a hot coal from the altar with a pair of tongs and he reaches out and he touches Isaiah and brings these words of comfort and hope. So let's just think about that for a minute. What we believe when we come to worship every Sunday morning is although we don't have that kind of experience. And I've joked around with the choir and I've joked around with just about every church I've served, particularly the one with about all but one I've had, I've served had a balcony. And I've always thought for Pentecost it'd be really cool if we had a zip line from the balcony to the chancel and we could bring the Holy Spirit in with, you know, we could do it upright. I, I joke around about that because I, I believe that's what the church should feel like. Because even though we don't see the hem of his garment and we don't see these things flying around, we should believe that when we come to worship, we're going to come into the presence of the living God. And part of that is because God has said, I have made you in my image and my likeness. So collectively, we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And God put himself in our hearts so that when we come together and when we look at each other's eyes and when we gather as people of faith or people who are on a journey or people who have come for the first time wondering what's going on inside those doors, then we come together in the presence of God. And some of us are fearful or reluctant to come in because of exactly what Isaiah said, that somehow maybe we're not good enough to go in that place. Maybe we're not good enough to be in the presence of God. But see, that's what Lent and Easter are all about. None of us are good enough. And that's why Christ had to come and live and die and be resurrected, because none of us are good enough. And so I, Isaiah acknowledged that and, and he needed assurance that it was okay, that God had forgiven him and that God had gifted him to be exactly who God was calling him to be. And so we come in these doors and, and, and sometimes those of us inside think that those of us outside are not worthy. We gotta be real careful with that too. 
Just because we've been inside for 40 or 50 years doesn't mean we're any better than on folks on the outside. And our job is to make sure that we welcome as many people as possible so that they too can come into the presence of the living God. And so that they too can begin, begin this journey which allows them to hear God's word and respond to God's word. So, so this is the powerful, this is the, the next part that is so powerful. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God calls in different ways. Um, people have often asked me about my call to ministry. And, I, and I've shared it before, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but, but my call happened over a period of time. It happened over a, a period of time, and um, you know, I, I've, I've been asked that question a number of times. I was asked it again this week when people look at your resume and they see Georgia Tech and then Emory. And those that know me well know the standard joke is, how do you get from Georgia Tech to seminary? And I tell them calculus. Um, and that was, that was a surefire way to make sure I understood what I could and couldn't do. But I, I can't say I've ever heard the audible voice of God. I can't ever see that I've seen the face of God as Isaiah saw the face of God. But what I can tell you is throughout that period of time and up until this day and going forward, each day is filled with moments when I recognize that God is speaking to me whether it be through my circumstance or through other people, through a news story, through the smile of a stranger on the street. Each day I recognize that God is speaking to me and God is still calling me and each day brings with it a new opportunity to respond to God's call and to serve as God would see fit. So what's interesting here is we go back to Moses, and Moses made every excuse in the book. I can't talk right. I'm that, this isn't, you, you got the wrong guy. And one at a time, God took away every one of his excuses until there were no excuses left, and Moses consented. But here's what's interesting about this one. God's not talking to Isaiah. Isaiah's present, but but he's not talking to Isaiah. He's talking to those gathered in the room. The, the seraphists are flying around and the other spiritual beings that might have been present. And so it's, Isaiah is overhearing this. God doesn't say, will you go? God is looking out and saying, who will be willing? Whom shall we send? Now, Zach's getting old enough to figure this out. You know, you get to be 10 and you no longer are subject to, to, um, to uh, um, reverse psychology, you know. Don't you dare do that when you need him to do it or, yeah, go right ahead. Just go on and do that when you want him to stop. I believe in some ways God knew exactly who he was calling, but he also knew the way in which Isaiah needed to hear the call. God knew Isaiah was present, and God knew what Isaiah was going to do, but, but God needed Isaiah to respond. And so God kind of shouted out, knowing exactly who God wanted to respond and how God wanted them to respond. And, and for us, it's the same thing. Sometimes we sit in a room, and, and someone is asking for someone to please step up. And we kind of look around and to see who else is gonna stand up and respond because surely someone will stand up and respond before I have to. We kinda sit on our hands, we kinda nail our shoes to the floor. But after having heard God wonder aloud, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah standing in the corner of the room in the midst of this purple hymn and the smoke billowing, says, here I am, Lord. Send me. Jake had no clue what he had just experienced. When the light shone through the window in the church and his body 
glowed from the light and he flipped down the center aisle. Isaiah really had no clue what he was saying yes to. He really didn't. The rest of this passage going on from verse 9 and forward is, is what God tells Isaiah to say. And I'm not going to read it for you this morning, but what verses 9 through 13 make evident is now that you have responded, let's be clear about what you've responded to. And I can summarize it for you. It ain't going to be easy. And so, where does that bring us this morning? I'm more excited than I've ever been in ministry because I love being in the city and I love being the pastor of Atlanta First United Methodist Church. And we have some of the best leaders, I think, ever assembled to lead the church. We had a great kickoff meeting several weeks ago that we've talked about, continuing to have dialogue and conversation. And there are some amazing things that are going to take place throughout the course of this year. But those leaders are not enough in and of themselves. And, and what I need you to understand, if you're sitting in the pews this morning, if it's the first time you're sitting in the pew or the fourth or fifth or the countless time you've sat in these pews, I need, we need everyone here to respond not to me, not to the church leadership, but to respond to God, here I am, send me. Send me to the side door to welcome that new family that's here for the first time and help them find where the nursery is or help them feel comfortable that they can be right here as an entire family and they're not gonna bother a person. Here I am, send me to, to the Easter egg hunt to make sure that there are plenty of people to hide eggs and to, to be hospitable to those who might come. We're gonna be in the middle of Grant Park. We're probably gonna have some folks just walking by thinking what in the world is going on here? I've asked you this, I'm gonna continue to ask you this, and, I, and this is as important as anything we're gonna do. Here I am, send me across the aisle behind my pew to say good morning and to welcome somebody. And here's the rules, as I've shared them with you before, I'm gonna share them a few more times. Here's the rule. If we've been here a long time, we cannot get offended when somebody welcomes us as though it was the first time we've been here. Because I wanna make sure that everyone who walks through these doors is made to feel welcome and warm and that they wanna return and that they wanna serve. Here I am, send me to Safe House the first Tuesday of the month so that others might know of God's love and grace and mercy. Here I am, send me to work on the Habitat House. Here I am, send me as the leaders are beginning already to try to establish who might be ready to lead in 2015. Here I am, send me, am I one who can lead this church, make a difference in this community? Now here's the deal. Most of us are not gonna have an experience like Jake or Isaiah. It's going to come in a far more quiet formation. And in fact, it's going to come in a way that if we're not sensitive to it, we might just miss it. And so what we're called upon to do throughout the year, but particularly during this season of Lent, is to be sensitive to the urgings of the Holy Spirit. To look at every situation, every person, as though it has the potential to be a call from God, a direction to lead us to do the work that God needs us to do. Will you support our Lord in this, his church, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Amen.